All right. Welcome everyone. Um, we have people starting to join, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the overview of VPG, giving you the basics of the value added producer grant. I'll start with a uh, uh, introduction of myself. My name is Lisa Mish. I am the Director of Farmer Outreach and Technical Assistance at RAFI USA. If anyone is joining isn't familiar with RAFI, we're a farmer serving um, organization based in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Kind of setting the stage for why we wanted to have this live stream today. There's lots of farmer pro programs out there, different loans and opportunities, uh, services, and it can get confusing sometimes what they're for, who they're for, when to apply. Um, but what's unique about the VPG grant is that it's one of the few grant programs for farmers, so grant funding. Um, so we wanted to highlight this one in particular, especially since the application window is open. Um, and reduce some confusion around it. And so I'll be um, hopefully giving a balance of enough details to help you make decisions about it while not going too far in depth. So it um, adds more confusion. But my goal for you today is that when you walk away, you can determine you know, whether this grant would be relevant for you and your operation and to um, that you know what to do next in terms of applying or where to go for additional help. So I'll first do an overview of what VPG is who can apply, um, what projects are possible under this funding, what does the application look like, and where to find help. Um, and the first, I don't want to bury the lead, uh, I'll, I'll mention my top tip at the beginning, which is if you are thinking of applying for a VPG, um, the first thing that you can do is contact your state VPG um, contact. So in each state within the Rural Development Office, there is someone specifically there that's that can help farmers access this grant program. And my uh, coworker, Beth, should be adding into the chat or the comments a link to the rural development page where they can, um, where you can select your state and then find who that contact is. Uh, and then I'll be staying on at the end of this presentation to answer any questions. So if things come up while I'm talking, feel free to add them in the comments as we go. Um, while I'm not uh, a fully versed expert in VBG, I'll do the best I can to, to answer questions as they come up. All right, so VPG, that's the Value Added Producer Grant. It is a grant through USDA Rural Development Agency, and it's for agricultural producers, producer groups, cooperatives to create and expand a value added producer owned business. The applications are open right now. Um, the due dates, the important due dates to keep in mind are April 25th if you're applying online. Um, and it, if you're doing a written application, the, they must be postmarked by May 2nd. Uh, so we're about a little more than a month out. And the basic purpose of this grant is to help farmers increase their customer base and increase their revenues through adding value to some raw agricultural commodity. What is value added? Um, that's when you have a food or product that's made from a raw agricultural product that you make. So that's like vegetables, grains, dairy, um, and that it's either one minimally processed and transformed into a new product like cheese or bread, um, or two, it's specifically or specially labeled or marketed as like organic or locally grown. Um, basically, it means that you're doing something um, either with your processing or your marketing um, that makes it more valuable and brings in more profit for you more than the raw product would do on its own. So classic examples would be um, taking the different vegetables that you make and turning into a line of salsas um, or creating a line of body care products from goat milk. Um, or say you have like a weird kind of heirloom squash variety that doesn't sell that well because it's, it's a weird shape or color. Um, you can add value to it by developing a marketing and promotional strategy that highlights this as a a special heirloom or especially good tasting squash. Um, so that's another sort of value add. Um, another comment that we'll throw in the chat is a link to um, a website that has some farmer profile videos of other VPG um, projects. So that's a place you can look to get a better sense of what sort of things are funded. Okay, in terms of who can apply, this grant is for farmers. Um, but within that, there's a couple eligibility types. The most um, widely used is the individual producer, and that can be a LLC, a sole proprietorship, a partnership. It doesn't matter so much on the business, business structure. 
You can also be an agricultural producer uh, group, a cooperative, or a majority-owned producer-based business. Uh, but I said most people apply as an individual producer. Location is not a limiting factor for this one. It's open to anyone that falls under one of those eligibility types and is a, a U.S. citizen. Um, and then the only other eligibility piece is that whatever value-added product you're applying for, you as the applicant have to produce at least 50% of the commodities that are used in it. So you can't just apply to you know, buy someone else's tomatoes for salsa. Okay, so a big part of this is what sort of projects can you do? What will the grant pay for specifically? Um, and I guess what I'll mention first off is that this grant is meant to support the value added product. It's not meant to support the farming operation or the production of that commodity. Um, it's meant to be an injection of capital to get a project off the ground. Um, so it's not meant to help start a farm um, or you know if you wanted to again if you wanted to like make that line of salsas it wouldn't pay for the tomato seeds to get that started it has to do with the creation the marketing of the processing of the value-added product okay um, so there are a number of different categories within the application that describes the type of grant you're applying for so it can get a little confusing but hopefully I'll, I'll um, break it down so the first distinction is you can apply for two different there are two different grant types and the grant types sort of describe where you are in your process of creating this value added product there's the a planning grant and there's a working capital grant the planning grant you can apply for up to seventy five thousand dollars and that is it's really only meant to pay for a consultant a third-party consultant to do a feasibility business or marketing plan um, for this potential value-added product that you want to create. So it's really good if you have an idea and you just want someone to kind of test it for you and then you have this this plan at the end um, that you can use for you know future funding um, or another grant application. And then the other grant type is a working capital grant and that you can get up to $250,000. Um, and for that, that's for like your shovel ready projects. You know exactly what you wanna do, you're ready to go. Um, and common expenses under that are the costs of processing the raw commodity into a value added product, packaging, label costs, um, ingredients, if you need to include other ingredients in whatever product you're making, um, promotion materials, advertisement, or um, staff support for the marketing or processing side of things. For both of those grants, you can um, get funding up to three years, um, but for planning grants, you shouldn't really be requesting more than 12 months to, because you wouldn't need much longer to complete that project, but for both, it can go up to three years. So those are the two grant types, and then there are specific project types, and the project types define what sort of value add you're, you're creating. Um, and I'll start with the most popular one um, is the change in physical state. So that's moving milk to cheese, wheat to bread. Um, you're doing some sort of physical transformation and that creates the value. Um, the, other, the other one that's kind of gaining in popularity is locally produced agricultural product. And that's when you have a product that's marketed and distributed within 400 miles of, or in the state in which the product is produced. So the, the value is that it's it's local and you're selling it locally. Like if you had a, a grape variety um, that was sold to a winery nearby or you had a local sweet corn that was marketed as, as such. The other three um, project types are not as common. Um, so I'll just, I'll mention them quick. One is physical segregation. That's like if you were separating your GMO corn from non-GMO corn, so you could you could um, market it as non-GMO. Um, there's one around how it's um, produced in a manner that enhances value, like if you're organic or free-range chickens or grass-fed beef, that sort of label is valuable, um, or farm-based renewable energy. So you have a, a commodity that's used to generate energy on the farm, um, which could be like dairy manure into methane or corn into biodiesel. Um, so those aren't as common, but those are um, three other project types. And the last sort of subcategory um, is within the working capital projects. And that defined, there's three types that sort of defined um, 
the direction you're going with your project. Um, so one is an emerging pro project or emerging, emerging product. Um, that's when you're creating a new value added product. There's also a market expansion, which is trying to get into a new market with an existing product. Um, and then I wanted to specifically highlight um, the simplified project type. Um, this is if your total request is less than $50,000. Um, but the advantage of doing a simplified project is that you don't need to supply a business or a feasibility study along with your application. Um, so if you don't have a, you know, a business plan lying around, um, that's a good one to look at because you can still um, get up to $50,000. You still need to show you know, what you think the impact of that project would be, but you don't need to um, you know, pay for or take the time to do that third party um, business plan. I also wanted to highlight a couple um, ineligible uses of funds that farmers may commonly um, want to include within a project. Um, the first one I kind of mentioned at the beginning was, you know, if you're including expenses related to the agricultural production, um, like seeds and fertilizer and other inpo inputs, um, you really have to focus the budget on the value added product component. Um, another one is facility repair, building construction. That's just a no-go, unfortunately, with the way the congressional statute works and um, kind of having permanent fixed um, investments. It, they're just not able to do that. Um, and that also applies to a lot of equipment, um, like refrigerated vehicles or large commercial kitchen um, equipment. That doesn't mean you can't like have a project that includes those things, but it would need to come from non-federal funds. Um, and one thing I'll note is that, you know, it, it's hard sometimes to know what's eligible, what's ineligible. Um, when they review applications, they give you a 10% sort of error margin. If 10% of your um, expenses are ineligible, they'll work with you to kind of figure that out. Um, but if you have over 10% of your expenses that are ineligible within a budget, it will be, um, it'll be thrown out. Um, so you really want to, again, work with that state VPG contact to kind of figure out um, if your budget is within bounds. Um, the other important thing about the use of funds in the budget is VPG requires one-to-one -one matching. That means that they want you to they want you to show that for every dollar of federal funds that they put in, you're in some way matching a dollar of other funds in in cash or in kind, um, which might sound a bit daunting, but it it's not. There's a lot of ways to um, get up to that amount through in kind um, matching. Um, probably the the best place to look first is looking calculating the um, the value of the raw agricultural commodities that you're using. So taking that fair market price and, and calculating that out, that might get you all the way there or might get you really close. Um, another place that you can add for matching is the value of your time and labor or other family members to complete the project. Um, there's other places you can find in-kind matching, but a lot of the time with the product and your time, you can get up to the matching amount. All right, so then there's the application itself. Um, I'll, we'll put a link into the chat right now to um, a rural development, the rural development website where you can click on um, to apply in, in the top um, line and you can download the either the planning grant toolkit or the working capital grant toolkit. It's, it's kind of a long document, but it's gonna tell you everything you need to know to apply and it will lay out the whole process. Um, so again, if you're thinking of putting together an application, I would go and download that um, document and read through it. Um, kind of broken into categories for an application, you're gonna first need to provide information about who you are, um, both yourself, your farm, what you're producing, how much. Um, then you'll, they'll ask you questions um, around your project, like um, you know your reach, your market, um, what this value-added product is going to be, why you think it's going to be successful. Um, and then they'll ask you questions about your budget, so summarizing, um, summarizing the budget at the, the end. And you know, one thing I'll say is that 
there's, there's priority points that you can request in an application, and that is different categories that um, rural development has highlighted as they really want to, funding to go there, so they'll add extra points to your application. Um, so if you identify as, let's see, a beginning farmer, veteran, socially disadvantaged, small or mid-size -sc mid scale farm, mid-tier value chain, or farmer cooperative, you can apply for priority points. Um, which they, they'll ask for a little extra information to verify that you belong in that category. Um, but that is, uh, that's a really good place to get some extra points in your application. And let's see. So other tips on applying. I mentioned at the top, contact your state rural development um, contact. That is the first place you should go if you're thinking of applying. They're there to help you um, think through your project. They can tell you if certain expenses would be ineligible. Um, I know for the for North Carolina, the contact is Jimmy Rogers, and he's um, mentioned in the past that he's willing to preview full applications um, with enough time, like maybe by mid-April. Um, if you can get something to him by then, like he'd be willing to to look through it and say, like I think this is going to score well. You need to improve here. Um, so that's something to look at. Um, and then, yeah, really following that grant toolkit to make sure you're not missing anything. Getting in eligible applications is the, is the biggest hurdle overall for VAPG. Um, I have some stats from last year, like the, the rural development got 828 applications total, but only 546 were eligible applications. And so the rest had to be thrown out. Um, but of those 546 eligible applications, 432 received funding. So if you can get an eligible application, um, that can make a huge difference. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in, chat. I'll, I'll wrap up with just saying a couple of places where you can go to help, for help, and then I'll, I'll circle back to them. Um, the first place, I think a few days ago, rural development staff did a joint webinar with Intertribal Agricultural Council where they did a full overview of VPG. Um, kind of similar information I shared here, but a little bit um, in more detail. Um, so that's a there's a Facebook Live link that will hopefully get added to the chat um, that you can check out. Um, National Sustainable Agriculture um, has a farmer's guide to VPG that gives a basic but good overview of the grant program, especially hitting on the deadlines and those different grant um, types that I described. Um, there's a group called Edible Alpha that does a page by page read through of the grant toolkit um, as a as a webinar, and I haven't I haven't seen that myself, but I think that would be a really great uh, resource to kind of get yourself oriented within that toolkit because it. It's, it's um, you know, it's kind of a long document, um, but we'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, and then I mentioned at the start, there's also um, a website where you can see different farmer profiles of past projects. So again, top tips, contact your state VPG contact um, and start working on your application now if you're thinking of applying, because this is not an application to throw together in a night. <laughs> Unfortunately, it takes a little bit of time to pull the pieces together, but um, very, very doable, very possible, and again, it's grant funding to, to really inject some capital into your operation and to um, go into a new product. All right, I think that is all the really important information I wanted to cover, so I'll switch over to um, if there are any questions. And I'm seeing one, is the product match what you would be selling your product for to customers? Please, okay. I'm not sure if I understand the first, is the product match what you would be selling your product for to consumers? Well, there's a question about the valuation, maybe I'll, I'll hit on that first, um, which I think is pertaining to the, the in-kind match um, of the product itself. Um, so for that, we'll go back to the salsa example. Um, so if you had, just say like 50 bushels of tomatoes, um, that were going to be used in making your salsa, you could go on to um, you know, either like, I think USD, USDA FSA has different um, fair market prices of tomatoes, um, or you could contact, you could contact your local extension agent to get what kind of the fair market prices of different commodities that you make, 
and then um and then multiply that out by the bushels and then use that as an in-kind match okay and then there's a question can you discuss the beauty projects you mentioned at the beginning more how would those qualify okay yeah because I, I i mentioned this as a kind of potential example of using goat milk for a line of body care products um which going back to the definition of value added's um, you know, a product that's made from raw agricultural products. Um, you know, you're doing something to it to make it more valuable. So the raw goat milk is your agricultural commodity. Um, it's still, it's it's still using a, a commodity, even though it's turned into something that's not food. Um, that still counts as you know, a value add. Um, so th hopefully that kind of answers the question. Uh, let's see. Are there any other questions coming up? Seeing a lot of action, okay. Okay, some questions about where the resources are coming from. Well, I'll probably continue to hang on for a couple more minutes if there's other questions that come up. Um, Oh, someone asked about CBD products. That's that's good. I didn't um, get into that. So um, there is new um, provisions for there to be the, to do value added products with hemp. Um, however, because of the, the lack of a FDA um, verification, I, I don't know all the, the details, but I do know CBD oil in particular is not allowable under VAPG, but you can do other things with fiber or construction materials or pretty much anything else with hemp. Um, that's still allowable. Is the priority list available? Should we only have one product? Okay, is the priority list available? Um, yes, if you download that um, planning, the either the planning toolkit or the working capital toolkit, it will be I think it's at the very bottom of that document. They talk about the specific priority um, areas. And again, let me list what those were. Um, that was if you are a beginning farmer, I know that's you know less than 10 years, a veteran farmer, socially disadvantaged, small, mid-size, mid-tier value chain, or farmer cooperative. Um, and usually, yeah, they ask for a little more information about, um, about you or your operation to verify that information. Should we only have one product to focus on? So I have heard um, from other rural development staff that they do like it if you can focus on one product. Um, not that not that it's impossible to do multiple, but they um, they see sometimes when applications have many different focuses, it can get a little uh, confusing and muddled. Um, so I think they they would probably recommend that you really focus in on one of the the products and um because also you can't you couldn't apply for say you did like an application for three different products then you couldn't apply the next year for just one of those because you had previously funded a project like that so it's more advantageous to focus on one get that up and rolling then apply again focus on another um and you can kind of do a more strategic um, focus on that where are these fair market prices found? Um, so usually every, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna say it the wrong place, but I'm pretty sure um, you know every state extension um, office is gonna have access to enterprise budgets, um, which are based on sort of national sales data. Um, I think you can also go to USDA, um, is it ERS? Um, even if you just Googled, um, you know, current, current market price tomatoes, you'll probably get a couple of hits of where to look for that. Um, and you would just want to reference that in your application. But again, I think another good place to go would be to maybe, um, like Google, if you're in North Carolina, Google North Carolina enterprise budgets for tomatoes or for whatever it is, um, or get in touch with, um, either your local extension office or your local USDA service center. If you have an FSA office, NRCS office you go to, they can definitely point you in the right direction. Um, 
yeah, the only thing would be if it, you do like a really specific type of crop, you might need to do some extra searching um, online for that. Okay, can you state the percent needed of ag products? Yes, so you need to show that you, pro you are producing at least 50% um, of the commodity that's being used within the project. Um, going back to salsa again, if you, you have to show, you show that you're provi providing at least 50% of the total tomatoes that are gonna be used to make this salsa. Okay, are supplements allowable? I'm a mushroom farmer, edible cultivated mushrooms. It's a good question. I cannot think of a specific reason why it wouldn't be allowed. Um, because you're still, yeah, you're still using a commodity, adding value to it, and, and by processing it, it's adding value. Um, so I would say yes with the caveat that you should check with your state um, VPG contact to confirm, um, but I can't think of anything in particular off the top of my head that would make it ineligible. Okay. I see another comment. I make pickles and peppers jams with produce I do not sell. Um, I make pickles and peppers jams with produce I don't sell. What steps to take for the grant on my added value products? Um, okay. I think I understand. So you, you make pickles, peppers, and jams that you're currently not selling but just using for self-consumption. Um, and just want to know like how to how to format the grant around that. Um, I mean, I think as long as you are are producing the different the cucumbers and and you know, whatever you're using in the jams, um, then you can do kind of a straight working capital grant with um, you're doing a physical change of state. Um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a pretty straightforward value-added project, um, if that's, if I'm understanding that correctly. Okay, I see a question about, um, is value-added only for commodity items? What about specialty crops, uh, microgreens, or medicinal flowers? Sorry about that, that's just terminology. Um, when I mean commodity, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, like, wheat and soybeans and, and, and corn, um, just a, a product, more, think more just agricultural product. So um, absolutely any of those specialty crops um, are very much encouraged to be a part of value added product um, projects. Um, sorry, farm, when I go to farmer's markets and don't sell, I pickle the rest. Okay, so you're using you're using excess um, products. Yeah, that makes perfect ses sense to me because um, you're you're um, growing your own products um, and then you're adding value for things that um, you wouldn't otherwise because they would be um, maybe no longer fresh or anything. So um, yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, we might be slowing down again with questions. Um, I did, well, maybe Beth can add this to the chat, but my email is lisa at rafausa.org. If you have other specific questions that come up, um, I'm happy to do a quick response. Um, and otherwise, yeah, get in touch with your local state contact and they can get you on the right path. Um, all right, with that, I think we'll close off the session, but. Thank you all for joining, and I hope that helps you get a better sense of what VPG is all about. Uh, I see one other question. Is it 50% of the weight of the product? I'm wondering what exactly the 50% means. Let's see. I wonder if I can pull it up really quick within the grant itself. I think it would be... I, I don't know if it really matters in terms of the, the you know, whatever unit you're using. Um, let's see, we currently produce, I own the majority. The wording within the grant is, I currently produce and own the majority more than 50% of the subject raw agricultural commodity to which value will be added in the project. You have to certify that. Um, so they're talking about 
ownership. Um, yeah, so not so much about the, the unit, just um, overall quantity that would be used, again, of the, of the main product. So um, you don't have to produce 50% of all the things that would be in the, the salsa. It would just have to be the tomatoes because that's the, the subject um, commodity that you're working with. Okay. All right, that's it. Thank you all. <laughs>